this chapter has been such a blessing to me. And uh, we're almost at the end. It's almost like saying goodbye to good friends. We're all in this together. That's the title of the message. And I began this message to Sunday, or oh, several Sundays ago, only managed to get to, uh, to half of the message. And I'd like you to read with me chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. We're coming to the end of this epistle. And let's start reading in verse 7 all the way to verse 18. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your state and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Salute you, and Marcus, sister son of Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive them. And Jesus, who is called Jesus, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he had a great seal for you, and then that are in the Laodicea, and then in Heliopolis. Luke, the fellow, uh, the beloved physician, and Demos greet you. So with the brethren which are in Laodicea and the uh, Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of Laodicea, and that you likewise the epistle from Laodicea. And say to our peoples, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen. Father, for me it's always uh, difficult to understand how somebody like Paul could remember so many names. But in every letter mm -hmm. that he writes at the end, he would take time mentioning how each one of these individuals, by name, affected his ministry. And as we were singing before, Lord, we're not in this alone. It's not about one or two or three doing the work and the rest just watch. It's all of us in the body of Christ doing our share. And here we have a good example. We think of Paul as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, missionary of all time. And then when we look behind the scenes, we see uh, who was moving behind him, who was pushing him forth, who was supporting him, who was encouraging him, who was uh, doing a lot of the footwork, who was doing a lot of the uh, supporting, Father, even in situations like a prison. There's a good cloud of witnesses here. We only mention a few in this epistle, but Lord, we need to take time to uh, look at each one of these individuals and see just what they did. These were not super Christians, they were just Christians understood that they had a part uh, in the work of mission work. And Lord, I pray that we will glean some understanding from this and that will encourage us to be more involved in the work of the church, in the work of missions, in the work of evangelism worldwide. I need your help tonight, Lord. My mind sometimes is drifts into Spanish and I have difficulty, Lord, trying to express myself. Lord, but I know that when you take over, things are much easier. So Lord, I pray that this next section that we're going to be covering will be one that we will 
to stop and check and see what's going on here. And there's a lot of things going on. The many words that Paul is putting here that helps us understand that, again, we're, we're not in this alone. We're in this together. So be with me, Lord. Be with all of us and help us, Lord. Um, uh, find the spiritual food here that will help us move on. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Paul was not just a soul winner, as I, this is how I started this section several weeks ago, but he was a tremendous, tremendous friend maker. And I'm amazed that anyone could actually memorize so many names. I'm terrible with names. But he actually, uh, my estimate is that there are more than 100 different Christian associates named and unnamed with Paul in the book of Acts and in the epistles, 100. If you ask me to remember 100 names or 10 names right now, I would have difficulty. I've had uh, problems of naming my grandchildren, so you know how bad I am with that. But Paul doesn't just greet them as in a friendly way, in a social way. He is actually genuine, genuinely concerned about their situation, about his friends. And here in this closing uh, a chapter we find that Paul mentions 11 people, six of them are associates in ministry. There are personal greetings, and each one of these individuals have been pumping in their service to move Paul forward, even in a situation like he was in, in the prison. He mentions three, first of all, he mentions Aristarchus, then John Mark, and another one called Jesus, or Justus, and they're all Jews, my countrymen, he says. Then several others, Epaphras has been a star in this book, and we have some more to say about this individual. He, he has truly inspired me, this man called Epaphras. And then his beloved physician, Luke, he mentions him here again. And then, so far in Paul's ministry, Demas is still with him, but then we're going to see later on, hopefully maybe next week, that Demas is one of those that forsakes him. <clears throat> so we have the outline, I think, is very simple. Those, the men who stayed, Paul needed uh, support. There were men who were willing to stay with him, even in prison. When I brought this across to the church, I said, if I, if I was put into prison, how many of you go in there voluntarily and stay with me for a few weeks? No hands were raised. <laughs> I think uh, Don said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> but there were men here that were willing to stay with Paul. He calls them my fellow prisoners. And they were voluntary men. They, didn't, they weren't really arrested. They were just there to support Paul. And then you find Epaphras was one of the prayer giants there. He, those are the men that prayed. Who's more important, those who stayed or those who prayed? Then for, unfortunately we find Demas there. And that's the one that strayed. But I was tempted to add one more point in here, just to kind of break the three-point <laughs> rule. And there, speak to you about the man that failed, just so you would rhyme. <laughs> and they were the ones that, their names are not mentioned. Paul started churches, but who did he leave those churches with? Some of, some of those men are mentioned, but many of them were not. And they were the ones that kept on with the work, even though Paul had to move. You know, sometimes we talk about the missionaries who go around the world and start churches. And they say, well, they left the national over here, they left another national over there, and they give the names, but, and then years later, those nationals are not there any longer, but somebody takes on the work, and it goes on for decades and decades and decades. Their names are not mentioned. They're not in the list. There's a good a, a number of them uh, all over the world, but I'm sure glad that the Lord takes them. Just to go through the notes uh, that we've already covered, first we, we talked about the men that strayed. We see them in verse 10, 11, and the first part of uh, verse 14. This group is made up of three Jews, Aristarchus, John Mark, and Jestus. Uh, and uh, uh, then we find one Gentile, Luke. And none of them uh, were characterized by their faithfulness to the Apostle Paul and in his hour of special need. We find, first of all, 
is faithful worker called Aristarchus. Man, if you talk about Epaphras uh, as being an inspiration, I would urge you to do a study on this man called Aristarchus. I'm even almost tempted to call the next grandson Aristarchus. <laughs> I don't know if my, my two sons would agree with me, but just seeing the, what's behind this individual, uh, is, you know, if, if, if any of my grandchildren would have this character that Aristarchus had, I would be a very, very happy grandfather. Paul calls him in verse 10, my fellow prisoner. My fellow prisoner saluted you. And as we saw a few weeks ago, this man was identified as Paul's fellow prisoner and fellow worker. You see that in verse 11, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me. Imagine being Paul's comforter. Now, he's a giant in the faith, I believe. But then, you know, as we see these things, we, we, we think, did Paul ever get discouraged? No, not Paul. Remember what he said, for me to die is gain, you know, for, for me to live is Christ. And, you know, you, you get these verses and you think, or like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, but who did Christ use to strengthen Paul? See, this is sometimes the Lord uses other people to accomplish his work. And I think Aristarchus was one of them. We find from Acts chapter 19 that he was a Macedonian and he traveled with one of Paul's companions. We find that very clearly in verses 29 and 30. He says, um, And the whole city was filled with uh, confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia. There's no doubt about that. And it, it also tells us in chapter 20 and verse 4 of Acts that he was. Uh, um, uh, from Thessalonica, it says, and there accompanied him unto Asia, Sopater of Malaya, and of Thessalonica, Aristarchus. What's so special about Aristarchus? Well, he was the kind of guy that if Paul was in a riot, he was right there with him. If Paul was in a voyage to Rome and your shipwreck, you know, was with him, Aristarchus. And he, if, he, if he goes through a violent storm, there he is. Starkus, and even in prison, Colossians 4.10, and the start with my fellow prisoner. If Paul, don't worry about wherever you're going, I'm going with you. If you go down, count on me. You know, that, that kind of individual just doesn't come easy. And Paul had the privilege of working with somebody with the character of Aristarchus. That's the kind of dying individual that sticks with it. No matter what the situation is. No matter what the risks are, no matter what tasks the dirty work uh, had to be done, uh, men like I start to say, you know, I, I'm very good dirty in my hands. I'm not just here for the pulpit work, I'm here also for cleaning and, and scrubbing and cleaning toilets. And I do it all happily because I do it for the glory of the Lord. And Paul, if you need help in prison, I'll be there with you. Wow. How many of us would like to have a, a brother like that um, close by in, in times of need. But you only see him a few times in the Bible. We hear of Peter, Paul, you know, all these great apostles, but you hardly ever uh, hear about individuals like Aristarchus. Then in, the, in verse 10, he also John mentions John Mark. You know, every time you mention John Mark, what do you think of? Ah, oh, he betrayed Paul. No, there's much more about John Mark than just that occasion when he failed in this first missionary journey. Yes, he did turn back, but boy, who does Paul uh, and other epistles write about John Mark. For, for one thing, he's one of the authors of the, uh, of the Gospels. We know by the scripture that John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas, the man who went with Paul onto the first missionary journey. And yes, we see that uh, he fled when things got difficult. But it wasn't the end of John Mark because later on we see, although there's a big quarrel with Barnabas and, and, uh, and Paul about taking him on the second missionary journey, Paul said, in no way I'm taking this individual with me. This is serious stuff. This is no children's game. This is not a birthday party. We're going to the mission field. This is uncharted territory. We might lose our life. We don't need anybody like Mark who would and Barnabas was the kind of guy 
that we all love because he would be the kind of guy that gives you second chances. I like Barnabas. I think he's the perfect um, church member. <laughs> when there's a need, he's the first one there. When there's an, uh, a ministry uh, to be covered, John, I mean, uh, Barnabas is right there. When the, there's somebody that walks in and nobody pays attention to, Barnabas goes right there and tries to comfort him, make him feel comfortable. You know, for me, Bar I, I preached a message, I think, one time, but I'm the perfect church member. And I preached on Barnabas. Well, here you have John Mark. He's failed, and John Martin and Barnabas is there trying to pick him up. <clears throat> Paul said, no, he's no good. And Barnabas said, well, if you're not going to take him, I'll take him. And he took him, and they both went to different areas of ministry, different fields. And uh, later on, and, uh, we hear about Paul saying, hey, bring Mark with me, with, uh, with you. I need him. You know, uh, Paul was not the kind of guy that would hold a grudge for a long time. Yes, Mark failed him, failed him bad, but Paul was too huge, spiritually speaking, that he would leave that in that situation. No, no, John Mark picked up, and he had others to comfort him and encourage him apart from Barnabas. But later on we see even Paul saying, I need somebody to comfort me. Bring Mark with you. And then this last individual we see here, Justus or Jesus, and Jesus, which is called Justus or Just, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. Justus was a Jewish believer who served Paul, but we know nothing of him. Try to write a book or at least a, a devotional on this individual. You find nothing. All you hear is, all you know about him is that he's a fellow working. He, he, he worked with Paul a shoulder to shoulder or elbow to elbow as they say here in Spain but he talks about him not just as a fellow worker but as somebody who comforted Paul you know you know these are only the men the men that are mentioned by name but how many others were in the life of Paul that actually moved them forward <clears throat> you know brother Tim it's always a great thing when we the churches invite us and they and they present to us, you know, the so and so is with us today. He's been in the ministry for 40 years and uh, he's done you know, this and that. They try to pump it up just to show that you've been faithful. And then inside of you, those who are sitting who think they know nothing about my ministry. If they only knew who were there beside me when I was ready to quit. These individuals are important. Look, my. Beloved physician, he puts that, that, that note there, beloved, he's special to me. What was so special about Luke? He was always with Paul in, in moments when he was sickly, always supportive. And if you look closely into the scripture, he's the, the only one that he mentions in um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10 through 11, he says, only, only um, Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Everybody else has uh, moved on. Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Very clear in verse 11. Now, so you have these men who stayed. And uh, praise the Lord for those who, when things get difficult in church, they're not here just for the party. They're here to clean up. They're here to continue the work. But are they more important than the next list? We find now Epaphras, the man who prayed. Look at verse uh, 12 and 13 with me. Epaphras, who is one of you. And remember, he's writing this letter to the Christians in Colossae. He says, he's one of you. And then he describes him, a servant of Christ. Now, you, you could not have a better title than that. A servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to say hi to you guys. But notice what he's doing for you over, the, over here. Although he's left Colossae, he hasn't finished his ministry with the people in Colossae. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> we meet Epaphras, if you remember, in the first chapter, in chapter 1. 
Just turn your Bibles there real fast in chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> As you also learn of Epaphras, our dear beloved servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto you the love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to decide that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. When Epaphras came, remember how this works with Epaphras, it's an interesting story. Epaphras is from Colossus, about 100 kilometers away from Ephesus. Paul is in Ephesus doing ministry. He decides to stay there for a couple of years. And here comes this man called Epaphras, who later becomes a convert of the Apostle Paul. Paul and Epaphras learns his disciple by the Apostle Paul. And time later, some time later, he goes back home to his hometown. And guess what he does in uh, Colossae? He starts sharing the gospel. And then uh, before he realizes, it has a, a group of believers wanting more. And uh, shortly later, he finds that he has, he's building a, a, a church. And he maybe, like maybe, he would say, you know, I, I, I wasn't counting on this. But look what the Lord is doing. And as he's moving to these other two cities that he mentions there, Hadiapolis and Odithea, he does the same there. And uh, he starts small congregations in every one of these towns. I happened to be in Heliopolis when I went to Turkey. There's just nothing but rubble there now. And I was looking, wondering, in all those different buildings that were all torn down, I said, I wonder where they did their Bible study. I would like to go there and just take a rock and put it with my collection. I had no idea. They all look the same. Just rubble all over the place. But... What made that kind of place special to me was that Epaphras, a simple man like any one of us here, would say, I love the Lord and I want to give this message. And he just did what he was taught to do. He just shared the message, people were converted, and very soon he became what we call a home missionary. Now, what motivated Paul, I mean Epaphras, to share the gospel? Notice there again in chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Paul says he was a servant of Christ. Paul called him a dear fellow servant. And then and there in chapter 1, verse 7, and a faithful minister. Again, I don't think anybody would desire to have a, a description, a better description than this. What are you? I'm a faithful. Somebody say this about you, even better. Saying it about yourself, I sound a little proud. But for somebody to say, Oh, this I present you, uh, this, uh, this is my friend, my brother in Christ. He's a faithful servant of Christ. It doesn't get any better than that. So we see that Epaphras loved Jesus and wanted to serve him and share his message of salvation. But he didn't do it alone. This is the thing. We're not in this together. And Epaphras also believed in the ministry of the local church and working with other saints. Again, you think of Paul needing help, but here's Epaphras now, also now needing help, and, and he, he finds that help. And because he was a team worker, because he knew how to blend with others in teamwork, the Lord um, uh, progressed, uh, made the, 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 the work advance. Now, what's so special about Epaphras? Well, I think his secret weapon, he was a prayer warrior. His prayer life was really what sticks out in this epistle. Um, he, you know, notice what it says in chapter 4, verse 12 again, about his prayer. For, we're going to be seeing this, concentrate the next 20 minutes on his, and how he prayed. I think we might learn something about how we need to pray. Some of the characteristics about his prayer life. First of all, he prayed constantly. Notice Chapter 4, verse uh, 12 again. It says there in the middle of the verse, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. Hold on a second. Is prayer a labor? I thought that was something simple. But just close your eyes and start speaking to the Lord. Now that kind of prayer is not simple. The kind of prayer that Paul, that, that uh, Epaphras uh, brought before the Lord was a tremendous, it was an agonizing type of prayer. Not that you need to uh, you know, uh, do some something, some, uh, um, um, what do you say, this, uh, I mean, wrestle with God in prayer. 
But we have a good example of this agonizing prayer. Notice also it says, is laboring fervently in verse 12. This word fervently comes from the word, it means agonizing. It is the same word used for the Lord's praying, remember in the mountain of Olives when he was in agony in Luke 22, 44 says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Have you ever prayed that way? Well, it was just, you're, you're, you're captivated by something and, you're, and it's, you almost don't have enough air in your lungs. It's just hard to pray. And for the Lord Jesus Christ, it was like this. It says, and being in agony, he prayed earnestly and his sweat was, at, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know, I, I long to hear prayers like that. Sometimes when you ask for prayer requests, it's, oh yeah, I'm going to pray for my kitten. He's not drinking his milk right. You know, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we, we hear things like that. Or uh, pray, you know, we, we talk about the very superficial things. And we think, or just simply, you know, just concentrate and praying for the sick. Just try to keep them away from heaven. Uh, keep them here as long as they can. So uh, keep them safe. Keep them sound. Keep them healthy. Pray that God will keep them healthy. Uh, you know, with Paul and with Epaphras, it wasn't that way. Prayer for these men was serious business. And this Greek word we found before, um, uh, fervently, was used to describe the athletes as they gave themselves fully to the sports. They were in agony. This was hard work. It wasn't just some superficial, some, you know, prayer that we just kind of uh, uh, bring before the Lord. Something else about his prayer, it wasn't just he prayed constantly and he prayed fervently, but notice now he is very personal in his prayers. In chapter 4, verse 12, he says, for you, and he has specific people in mind. It's not, uh, Lord, I pray for the whole world, and I pray for uh, people to be saved, and I pray uh, that God will keep all the saints healthy, and that's kind of thing, just, you know, I, I, in two seconds, I've covered everybody in the world. It's not like that. It's, he, he's very personal about and, and, and he's very intense about their personal need, what they really need. And notice that, that what he prays for, mentioned also in chapter 1, is not just physical or um, uh, needs it's, or material needs. It's more the spiritual. He's concentrating in, Lord, make them complete. Now that they've started this race with Christ, make them complete. Make it help them get a, a spiritual understanding, have spiritual intelligence. The know-how to live the Christian life, so that they will see the blessings behind that. That's what that's the priority there. It says for you, for the saints, not just in Colossae, but also in Laodicea and Hierapolis. He he's striving, he's fervently praying for them. He prayed personally, he prayed constantly, he prayed fervently. But notice something else: he prayed. De uh, uh, definitely name after name I'm sure uh, Epaphras would have their name and you think well how did Paul know that Epaphras prayed this well well he was a fellow prisoner remember he slept with this guy they were there in the same cell he heard Paul heard Epaphras pray maybe in a little corner of the cell just fervently praying there almost like in agony, and Paul thinking, "Hey, Professor, you're right. Yeah, Paul, just, I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later." And he just goes into this prayer. He's having a, a very intense time with the Lord. He knows what he's, he hears what he's been praying, and notice what he prays for you that they may be perfect, complete, all in God's will. You see these words there: to stand perfect. To stand complete, not just in a few things, in all God's will. You know, the word all is a key word in Colossians, used over 30 times in this epistle. And he also wanted them to stand perfect and complete. So the contrast with the Gnostics, remember we started with that, is the Gnostic teachers offered these Christians perfection and maturity but they couldn't deliver the goods. 
Only Jesus Christ can do these things. Paul there in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says, And ye are complete in him, for only Christ is able to fill you up. So the, this the request carries the thought of being mature and perfectly assured in the will of God and parallels Paul's prayer in chapter 2, verse 2. Look with me, chapter 2, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. This is what they pray for. What was the last time you uh, came to a church prayer meeting and said, okay, I, I'm really concerned about this. I really need, I think we need to pray for each other. That we're knit together. You know, the ladies know about knitting. I learned how to knit. When I was a little boy, I learned, I, I forgot how to knit five minutes after I learned. <laughs> It's, it's hard work, you know, but Epaphras and Paul are thinking, you know, this is what we really need to pray for. That we're knit together. That we're intertwined. So, inseparable. Chapter 2, verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. This is what unites them. This is the glue. You know, doctrine is important. Doctrine gives you structure. But what is the glue that brings us, that glues us together? It's that love. Kneeling ourselves in love and onto our riches of the full assurance of, of understanding. In other words, not just love to bring us together, not just the glue, but a, an assurance, an understanding of the knowledge, acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and the Christ. He's praying, Lord, help us. We, we've come so far in our knowledge, but we want, we want it all. I want more. I remember when I was 18 years old, and I was never full when I was eating. At, at the age of 18, I was able to eat three steaks on a loaf of bread this big with a full one, one and a half liter cup. And then I was looking for something else as, uh, for dessert. 18 now, that doesn't happen now. I was able to eat a chicken and a half, and, I was, and it was always more. I want more. Then you tell me, you had enough? My mother, and my mother is the one who was to blame, because every time I finished eating, she'd go, what about this? Okay. You go, it was never enough. You know, I wish we would have the same hunger for the things of the Lord. You want more? All you can bring, bring it on. I'm ready to take it in. But so many times it's just, Pastor, are you going to give us a whole hour and a half of service? You mean you're going to preach for 45 minutes? Well, don't put Brother Tim on. He's going to be preaching for an hour. Well, no, we don't want to Brother Tim to get on here. We should be wanting the food with, with, you know, with, a, with, a, with, with true hunger. Have you ever tried to cook for somebody that has no appetite? Oh, my mother hated that. <laughs> And my mother liked to cook, and she would always cook like, if there was five people coming, she would cook with 20. That's my mom. And uh, when she saw somebody that was not eating, she would get very concerned. And then she would just go, oh, I need to try that. Oh, what's that? What is that? You know, oh, that would get her nerves. And, but, you know, when she had somebody who would just dig in, you know, she would be happy. I find sometimes Christians who are like, what are you going to bring us today? I don't think I'm coming on Sunday. They kind of want to get, what are you going to be bringing? Is it a topic that I like? Or, you know, I don't want to go to last Sunday's service, Brother Francisco preach on the wrath of God. No, I don't want to do that. You, know, you might think, Sammy, you're being very exaggerated. That's what I do. But only to capture your attention. He prayed uh, definitely, and he prayed sacrificially. Notice in verse 13, Colossians chapter 4, verse 13. For I bear record that he had a great seal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Heliopolis. A great seal, in, or in much distress. Now this kind of prayer is difficult. Again, when Jesus prayed this way, it, it was an agonizing prayer. A 
And Paul identifies with that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, I had great conflict for you. I was in much distress. <clears throat> Again, it doesn't mean that you know you need to, to pray right, you need to be wrestling with God. It's not a wrestling, it's not like God saying, I'm not gonna give you anything, let's see how much you're resisting me. No, it's not that kind of thing. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that. It means that we are really concerned about something and we're not ready to let go. This is something urgent that you need. To rephrase what John H. Jowett said about praying, he said, praying that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. Interesting. And all of the men with Paul were named and uh, all the, the, the names that Paul mentioned are very, very special to him. They, uh, he's ministered, to, but now he, they're very deep into his heart and this epicurus now has become even more and more uh, personal to, to the Apostle Paul. I was looking for some commentary just to fuel the message and I found an interesting comment by uh, a commentator called Warren Wiersbe. He put it this way, Epaphras was Paul's fellow prisoner but even confinement could not keep him from entering the courts of heaven and praying for his brothers and sisters in the churches. I love that. <clears throat> Having prayer warriors is something that's very, very encouraging. Uh, you, John, Diana, you need to close your ears. You've heard this before. Have I told you about those three ladies, those three old ladies from uh, Vacaville? That's North California. I'm here invited to the church. I'm, I'm invited to preach, present my ministry. Everything went well. Uh, and when the church service started, uh, three old ladies came in, almost kind of uh, unaware. And they just came in very slowly. And I thought, oh, these ladies need help. And they sat in the back and they just sat there with an interesting smile on their face. And as I was preaching, I couldn't help but notice that they just when there was a, it was kind of a suspicious grin grin on their face. At the end of the service, a few fellows said, "Well, hopefully, hopefully we can help you out with the support or whatever." But these ladies came and said, "Brother Perez, can we can we talk to you for a second? I said, "Oh, well, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, can I help you?" Just and all three ladies kind of looked at each other with a very suspicious look and said, "What are you going to support?" you brother Perez but you need more than financial support you're gonna you're gonna need you're gonna need you're gonna need a, a, a secret weapon I said what kind of secret weapon are these three ladies gonna offer me they said you see we we can't do very much in church anymore uh, you know sometimes we can't even come to church because we're hurting and we're not as strong as we used to be we used to be very uh, busy in church services and ministry, but uh, nowadays what we do is pray. You see, we are prayer warriors. I looked at these three ladies like prayer warriors. They didn't look like warriors. And they said, "In brother Perez, the Lord's going to be with you. You know what? Because we're going to be praying for you. We're going to pray earnestly." They, they kind of disappeared from the scene. And as I was driving back home a few hours back, and I was thinking about these three ladies, I couldn't remember anybody else in the church but these three ladies who said they were prayer warriors. You know, they comforted me so much. And I talked to them, and I said, what did you think about those ladies? I said, they seem, you know, typical of Manisa, they, they seem to have one foot on the tomb already. <laughs> <clears throat> they, were, they were not looking very healthy. I said, but you know, if they can, uh, if they are there for us, to support us, I praise the Lord for that. And you know what? I, I went through many churches during that time. And many of those churches encouraged me a lot. And my dear sir. But you know the ones that I remember most? Those three old ladies. Every time I went through difficulties here, I wondered, are those prayer warriors are still there? bringing us up before the throne of grace. Are there, they're still there. 
They were the kind of uh, individual like Epaphras who prayed earnestly. Now we see several ways that Paul prayed. He they prayed sacrificially. They prayed personally. They prayed definitely. They prayed constantly. They prayed fervently. Now, there was many things that we can learn from Paul's prayer, but those were the ones that prayed. We see the ones that stayed, and they are so important in ministry. The ones that will back you up when nobody else will. You'll have a lot of people who will pat you in the back, say, Pastor, don't worry, we're behind you. And they're never there when you need them. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for those who stay and who stick with it. And praise the Lord to those, even though they might not be around, they're still praying for you. The prayer warriors. Now, so far, it's, the message is very encouraging. And still, in this time in Paul's ministry, um, um, we find this uh, man called, um, um, what's his name now? Demas. Demas. You know, I think he pronounced it in English, Demas. Demas was with Paul all the way through, but I mean, made names him as one of the co of the co laborers in ministry. He's still there. He's still sticking with it. He's still working hard. He's still laboring fervently. He's praying. But something caught his attention in the world that distracted him. Distracted him, I'm sorry. And made him go astray. We'll talk about him next week. This won't be a happy tone. And unfortunately, there are people like Demas who start well but never end well. Many, unfortunately, stray. I wonder what kind of Christian we are today. Are we there for the hard work or only for the, the, that hour, maybe hour and a half every once in a while? Or do we really mean business when we call ourselves the body of Christ or part of the body who understand we have a labor to offer to the Lord? Are we that kind of individual who will stay, who will stick with it uh, thin and thick. Whatever the situation, you know that this individual will be there. I'm very encouraged that the 28 years we've been here that I find I found people like that. We're not perfect, far from it. But when things got difficult, they they, they stood right beside you. But even the times where you know we failed, you know missionaries fail. Except Sammy, he doesn't fail ever. <laughs> We fail. And you know, even though we fail sometimes, there's somebody there to say, we understand, you're not perfect, you're not, you know, we're there, we're here for those moments where you need to be picked up from the ground. Praise the Lord for those epiphras, for those individuals like the three he mentions first, who are there to stay. And then for those who pray earnestly, eagerly, specifically, in a way that will bring the body of Christ together. So as you, as you see, we can close this chapter and think, well, there's nothing here for us, but there's so much here. And I think we need to pay attention to this this afternoon. How many of us would need, as we look at this, to say, Lord, I'm not one of those who stay, who would stay. I'm not one of those who really prays. I even, don't even know the names of the people in the church. I don't even know their needs. And some of us might be hearing this and saying, I don't care. If you're in that condition, I think you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Let's stay and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we've looked at a few names at the end of this chapter. We'll be looking at uh, that other section where we will find Demas so far in his walk with you as a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's stuck with it. He's been with him all the way through. But maybe someone here would say, well, you know, I want to be there too. But maybe we're looking outside thinking, well, maybe this is not for me. Maybe I should look beyond. Maybe I should look for something more exciting. 
Maybe I should go back into the world and find my place there. But I don't know where we are. I only know where I am. And, it's, I'm, and still I've got difficult to see that clearly. But surely all of us are in need this afternoon. We have a need to be truly committed. Surrendered really is the best word that we can use. A surrendered life. One that would show that Christ in, in a very clear way. We need prayer warriors, Lord. They are so important in the church. The lifeblood of the church are those who pray this way with, with agony in their heart, with intensity, looking for the body to be completed, to be fully united, to function as one body together. We're all in this. And so, Lord, may this not just be a message, one more in the series. May this, may this be a call to each one of us to move close to you. Make, uh, to take, make some decisions. To make some moves. Maybe get out of our comfort zone. Maybe we have so many commitments that we just can't think about the things we're looking at here. Or maybe we need to cut down some of those to get more involved in ministry. Which is really what your interest is in. So Lord, whatever the situation we might be in, I pray that this evening we'll deal with it. And when we solve it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.